Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church, and because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Hear the words of the psalmist. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone and his compassion is over all his works. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the needs of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all those who love him but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, 
bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over from the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This is today's sermon, provided by Father Frank. Well, here it is, hurricane season once again. It has something to do with wind currents and water temperature, but I really don't know what causes them. Just that some number of them romp across the Atlantic Ocean each year right on cue. An apparently relatively weak one entered by way of the Gulf this week. They say another is on the way. But there are hurricanes and then there are hurricanes. Some are more dangerous than others. Hurricane Andrew, a Category 5 storm, devastated parts of South Florida in 1992. I was then a member of Christ Episcopal Church in Kennesaw. My friend Scott Kidd, who is now the rector of the Episcopal Church in Salty, was the senior warden. Well, due primarily to the efforts of Brother Scott, within 48 hours of the disaster, our congregation had collected enough food and dry goods to fill the biggest U-Haul truck. Scott and another parishioner drove that truck full of provisions all the way to Miami. And getting there wasn't easy because the National Guard was hesitant to believe that two guys with a truck full of provisions were intent on giving it away. The authorities were very suspicious of those whom they suspected would try to take advantage of the situation and attempt to profit on the backs of those who were in need. But make it to Miami, they did. Nothing too remarkable about this, that part of the story. But when Scott got back home, he told me how upon arrival at the Episcopal Church in Miami, they had backed the U-Haul truck up to the parish hall. The parish hall, of course, was much bigger than the truck in terms of square footage and space. Yet my friend said the more they unloaded, the more food there was. And by the time the truck was completely unloaded, the parish hall was completely full. I asked my friend how he could explain that. He answered with a kind of matter-of-factness that took me by surprise. He says that the only explanation was that there had simply been a multiplication of food. Scott was so matter-of-fact that it did not even occur to me to challenge his explanation. Did more food come off the truck than was loaded in Georgia? My friend told that it was so, and he was there. And I trust his reporting, but I don't know. I have no evidence other than my friend's recounting of the event. But what I do know is that some people in Miami receive food and supplies that they would have gone without had Scott not taken it to them. Did Jesus feed a multitude of people from a little bread and fish? Well, let's spend a few minutes with that story. At some level, if we're honest, I think most of us want an answer to that question. Did a miracle occur on that hillside in Judea or not? I have to tell a story on myself. I can remember very well as a young person reading this story very carefully. I was, quite frankly, fascinated by it. For some reason, I was thinking about this gospel story, and so I wanted to read it again. I went and found a Bible, and I read the story again. I mean, read it slowly, word for word. I was very intentional in that reading, for what I was looking for was the exact moment in the story where the multiplication took place. My thinking was that if I could just find the exact point in the story, it would be revealed to me, and anyone else who read it enough, just how this thing took place. But of course I could never find it. It's a very cleverly worded story, and I assure you that if you try to find the moment where the magic happened, you can find yourself getting very frustrated. Allow me one more illustration. I speak of the impulse some have had over the centuries to look for that exact moment during the preparation of the elements at the service of communion, when the bread and wine becomes no longer mere bread and wine, but rather the body and blood of Christ. Is it, as some theologians have proffered, is it when the hands are laid upon the elements? Is it the point where we invoke the Holy Spirit by saying, sanctifying them by your Holy Spirit? Does it occur at the beginning of the prayer or at the end? Or maybe somewhere in the middle? People have actually advocated that the substantial change in the elements takes place between certain syllables and certain words of the liturgy. Maybe we could agree to such considerations, 
while maybe intriguing to some, does not get to the heart of the matter. Likewise, maybe it's impossible to explain this story about the multiplication of food by way of reading about it with a magnifying glass. Many have suggested that the power of the story is to be found in the sharing. That is, when the people saw the disciples sharing what little they had, others then began to share what they had. And in that way, all were fed. One commentator points to the language that would seem dismissive of the women and children who were present. Remember, the text says, those who ate were about 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. The hypothesis goes like this. The reason that there was so much food was that all the women, as they are wont to do, had brought picnic baskets, and in those baskets was food for themselves, their husbands, their children, and of course enough for one or two friends that they might meet in the crowd. So of course there was enough food for everybody. But since the gospel writer was inclined to not recognize the presence of women, he indeed did not recognize where the food had come from, and so he assumed that what he had witnessed was a miracle. Well, maybe. But again, such explanations do not go to the heart of the matter. In fact, to search the text for the moment of the miraculous, or for that matter, to search the text of the Eucharistic prayers for the exact moment of the change or transformation of the elements from bread and wine into flesh and blood can, or so it seems to me, even begin to trivialize the Eucharist. So if the miracle aspect of the feeding is maybe not the only or even the most important aspect of the story, where do we look for another level of meaning? I submit that we might begin by not focusing so much on what Jesus did that day as on what he was suggesting we do. So let us join Jesus and the disciples in this crowd for just a moment. Jesus had been seeking something of a respite, but the crowds had followed him to this hillside, something in excess of 5,000 people, maybe two or three times that number. And the Jesus vestry, or maybe it was the worship committee, was getting anxious. Uh, Jesus, maybe you haven't noticed, there's a lot of people gathered here. People have come here to see and hear you. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, we're kind of out in the country. I mean, you can look north, south, east, and west, and there ain't no McDonald's in sight. I mean, there ain't even a Voyo station out here. And to tell you the truth, I'm so hungry right now, I could eat a sandwich from a gas station. So Jesus, me and the boys have had a little meeting, and we think you should send these folks away, at least for now. Let them go into the towns nearby and get themselves something deep. I mean, shoot fire. We didn't call this meeting anyway. You know what I mean? These people just kind of showed up. Whatever, but we've got a real problem on our hands, and it's time to send these folks away and take care of themselves. Well, I have to admit, if I'm entirely honest, if I'd been there in that disciple's shoes, I might very well have been a member of the Send Them Away Committee too. It was a logical solution to a problem, and to a problem that had the potential to get really out of hand. But Jesus didn't say, send them away. Much to their surprise, and I can only imagine the chagrin of the disciples, he said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. I can only imagine the restraint it took for the disciple who was representing the send them away committee not to literally shout at Jesus saying, Jesus, there are 10,000 people here and we ain't got nothing but five loaves of bread and two measly crappy. Well, even that reminder of the facts on the ground was not enough to cause Jesus to come to his senses. Rather, I imagine he might have come to his feet, as he said, referring to the bread and to the fish, bring them here to me. Bring what there is here to me. And he instructed the crowd to sit down, a calming gesture in and of itself. And the text says that he took the bread and he looked up to heaven and he blessed that which was before him. And he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat. And then he said, now go feed my people. You give them something to eat. And then the text says they were filled. They were satisfied. They were not just tied over until the next day or until they could find a McDonald's. No, they were filled, and there was even food left over. In the hands of and in the presence of Jesus, there was abundance. As children of God, we are invited to come into Jesus' presence, take, eat, and be satisfied. But then Jesus says, turn around and go out into the world and make a difference. Offer to your neighbor what he or she needs so that they might also be filled. You might invite them to church where they, like you, 
can also be refreshed by way of holy food and drink around a table of fellowship where Jesus is present. You may be moved to offer your neighbor a ham sandwich. Maybe you need to offer a word of encouragement. Or maybe it's some other gesture that, for that person, represents a way forward to greater health and prosperity. I don't know, but if you're open to it, you will know what it is you are to do or say. I close this morning by bringing to mind a scene from one of my favorite books, A Tale of Two Cities. You may, may remember the scene. Carton, who has just confessed that what he is about to do is a far, far better thing than he has ever done before, and is riding in a cart towards the guillotine, a condemned prisoner. Also in that cart is a young woman, a girl really, who in the insanity of this moment in history is likewise to lose her life in the name of a revolution. She says to Carton, Will you hold my hand? I am not afraid, but I am a little weak, and it will give me courage. So the man and the girl hold hands as they reach their common destination. She looks up at this man with the quiet, composed face. This man who is a non-anxious presence even in the face of death. And she says to him, I think you were sent to me by heaven. Of course, one has indeed been sent from heaven, not only to this girl, a character in a Dickens novel, but to us all. And he says, come and be satisfied. Come. Come, for it is not only possible for 5,000 people or more on a hillside somewhere near Jerusalem to be filled, but it's also possible for you to continue on your journey towards the great good that is God's intention for you and all of creation. And finally, it's also possible for you to participate one gesture at a time, one encouraging word at a time, one helping hand at a time, one step at a time, and maybe even one courageous moment at a time. You may participate in the transformation of the world in the direction of the good. That is to say, in the building of God's kingdom right here on earth. Amen. The Prayers of the People Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. Remembering especially Michael, our presiding bishop, our bishops, Rob, Don, and Paul, and Frank, our priest. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for our mayor, Jimmy, our governor, Brian, members of the Congress of the United States, Donald, our president, and all who hold authority in the nations of the world that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. During this time of pandemic, heal those who are sick with this virus. May they regain their strength and health. We remember healthcare workers and first responders. May you keep them safe. May your guiding wisdom be with us and may your healing hand be upon us all. We pray for school administrators, teachers, staff, and students as we discern how best to do school this fall. And regardless the structure, means, or venue, we pray for all who will be re-entering and re-engaging our institutions of learning. Bless all schools that they may be centers of sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom. Remembering especially Winona, Alice Fay, Tom, Gail, June, Colleen, Ellen, Amber, Frank and Florn, Barbara and Chris, Bill, Dan, Gordon, Jim, Alan, Adam, Shane, Garrett, Blake, Richard, Charlie, T, Richard, Gabriel, Noah, Jim, Gary, Amy, Carl, Eileen, and Joe, and those of this congregation who were comforted by our continuing and sustaining prayers. 
have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. We remember those who celebrate their birthdays this week. Renee, Dan, Dennis, Elizabeth, and Mary. O oh God, their times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. We also remember this day, James and Kathy, on the occasion of their anniversary. Grant them wisdom and devotion in the ordering of their common life, that each may continue to be to the other a strength in need, a counselor in perplexity, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. May their wills be so knit together in your will and their spirits in your spirit, that they may continue to grow in love and peace with you and one another all the days of their life. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help, for you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us now pray in the words that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And so now, eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen.